go. How's the family today? Amen. Wasn't that great? Give the band and the Kindle. My gosh, what a blessing. Well, I can promise you this morning, I don't think there's another church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that has invited the guests that I have invited today. Because I, I, I had to go back in time and find some really special guests. This morning, I invited Eve to come and join me this morning to help me kind of get this message out this morning. So Eve, if you would, come on up. I'd go way back in time, way back in time. Also, also, not only just Eve, I had to get Adam to come give me a hand too. Adam, where are you at? There we go, there we go. Y'all didn't know Adam wore a cowboy hat back in the time, did you? All right, and then you guys back there in the back, would y'all bring my buddy up here just saying? I, I know you can't figure out what, where we're headed with this service. I, I don't think anybody can figure out where we're going with this thing, so... Let me get my buddy up here just for a second. There we go. Come on with it. I, 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 need, to, I need to let you know this morning, I hate snakes. I do. I, I do. I, 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 I don't care for them. Matter of fact, I think the first time I preached here, there was a snake in the floor. I, I don't understand. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like snakes. I just don't. I just don't like them. You guys, thank you all so much for bringing Critter up here. Appreciate that. You all bear with me for just a second. I don't like this at all whatsoever. No way. Yeah, I, I, I. All right, now, hey, be still. Be still. Let me get, be still. Get off of me. Oh. Ah. Uh. My name is Serpent. What's your name? Oh, you're Eve, are you? Ah. Oh. Well, I see that you're in a beautiful garden. You've got all kinds of fruit and vegetables and trees and stuff. And I noticed I noticed there was a tree over here that had some nice-looking fruit on it that's just really, really nice. And, uh, do you eat that fruit too? No. And why don't you eat that fruit? Because God told us not to. God told you not to? He told you you would die? Oh, you surely are not going to die. You just, you won't die. You know what? God, God knows that if you eat that fruit, that you're going to be just like him. You will be, you'll be smart and, uh, and uh, you'll be just like him where, you know, knowing good and evil, all that kind of stuff. You're not going to die from the fruit. Go ahead and just try a little bite of it. You might just like it. I told you it's good, didn't I, huh? Uh-huh. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's good stuff, man. Yeah, we got this. Woo! -hoo -hoo. That's good, ain't it? Y'all notice you ain't got no clothes on. You got to get your camouflage on, just saying. Yeah, right on. It's good. What's the matter with you guys? Why are y'all all dressed up like that? What's what, what's what y'all what what's going on here? Oh, you didn't have it. Oh, you thought you yeah. I noticed that myself. Just saying. 
Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Where are you? Who's that? you who told you you were naked have you eaten from the fruit of the tree that I command you not to eat from <laughs> Eve did it woman what is this you have done Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock. But I don't want to be cursed. That's you, Mr. Snake. I don't want to be cursed. Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. But I. But you I, will crawl on your belly. What? And you will eat dust. I don't want to. All the days of your life. I don't want to fall on my belly. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offsprings and hers he will crush your head and you will strike his heel <laughs> Eve, Eve I will greatly increase your pain in childbearing with pain you will give birth to children your desire will be from your husband and he will rule over you. Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat it. Curse is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Guys, give my, give my cast a hand here this morning. I told you uh, I don't really care for snakes. I don't. Uh, but I, there's sin, sin in this world. I, I, find, I find some things really interesting about this one. I really got to study in this in depth. Number one, the serpent. Now, we don't know if the serpent was really a snake, but from reading the Bible, that's close as I could get. So I'm figuring somehow that the serpent either had some feet down there where he could walk and he could talk like this at one time, point in time, but then God told him, from there, you're going to go to the ground. But my question to the serpent is this. What did you have to gain by convincing Eve to take a bite of the apple. What did he have to gain from that? Nothing. He had nothing to gain from it. Why would he instigate such trouble on Eve and Adam when he had nothing to gain from it? So, God punishes the serpent for just causing trouble. I, you know, do we... I know we don't have any troublemakers in our church, do we? No, heck no. We don't have any troublemakers. But then the choice came to Eve. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Eve knew better. She knew. She, she told the servant. She said, look, guy, God said it for us not to eat of the fruit or we are going to surely will die. The serpent, the instigator, the person who caused the problem, started the ball rolling. Convinced Eve to take a bite of the forbidden fruit. She knew better, but she did it anyway because, you know, who's watching? And then Adam, he was a follower. 
Eve took a bite of the apple. And, of course, Adam wanted to, he knew better. God told him too. He says, don't, don't eat from that fruit. It, it, you're going to surely die. But Adam went ahead and took a bite. And God banned, banned, banned them from the garden. They had to, he had to go out and earn his living. Had to go out and work for what he had to eat where he, where he was in the garden where he could just go pull fruit and eat from it. They had a, they had a, I think that's where God numbered the days. And God says, he didn't give them an exact number, but he says, you're going to return to the earth. You're going to pass away. You're going to go home. But he told them then, you're, you're not going to live here anymore. So we got three different things. We got the instigator, had nothing to win, had nothing to lose from just, he didn't realize he had something to lose, but I'm going to tell you, with sin comes consequences. Every sin, and we, and a lot of, do y'all ever do this? Do y'all have this problem? You get temptation from the serpent, something, something out there in the world at your office or whatever. You get, you get tempted by listening to jokes or, or by another person or whatever, but you get tempted and you think, I can rub up against this sin just a little bit, and I'm not going to let it get on me, but I'm going to rub up and play with sin just for a little bit and get close to it, but I really, I'm really not going to let sin get into my life. And yet, sin finally wins out, and you think, God's not going to see this, but he does. God sees everything you do. I want us to sw switch over to another little place in the Bible, if you don't mind. Let's go to 2 Samuel. We're going to go to chapter 11, starting in verse 2. This is, this is, the, this is about David and Bathsheba. You all have heard the story. I've read this, I read this verse pretty much every day for a while, just to under, trying to understand this, understand this. Now, let's just go ahead and start now. On chapter 11, verse 2, starting off there, it says, One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't that Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, right there, there should have been an end to it right there. She was somebody's wife. She was married. It should have quit right there. David should have said, okay, that's okay. It's, she's just a beautiful woman. I have a, I have a hard time understanding why Bathsheba was taking a bath. I, I, I got to feel, this is kind of my thinking. That my brain thinks different than most people, and my wife will vouch for that. But Bathsheba, she, her husband's off at war. She's home by herself, okay? I wouldn't doubt that Bathsheba knew David's routine where David gets up and goes out on the roof. She probably, she may have, I don't know, I, this is not written in the Bible, so you can't quote this. This is just, just my thinking. But she could have been out there taking a bath whenever she knew David was going to be up there looking because she was lonesome. And so she was out taking her bath, but David seen that. So let's move on right on through it. Then David sent a messenger to get her. She came up with him, she slept, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from the uncleanliness, and then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Okay. The best I can tell from this right here, it was a one-time affair. So she came up. What should have happened when David found out that she was the wife of somebody else, it should have been the end. Done. We're not going to go any further with this. Bathsheba. Bathsheba got invited up to David's place, and she got there, and when he said, I want to sleep with you, she should have said, I'm married. Uriah is my husband. I'm not going to do this. That's where it should have ended. It should have been a total end, but she didn't. And back in the day, when they didn't have birth control, she was, she should have been, she shouldn't have gotten pregnant, according to their thinking, but she did. And she sent word to David. Now, here's where one sin Actually, more than one sin, but that one sin has all these circumstances that fall in behind the start of a lie. And here we go. 
So he sends, he sends word to Joab to send me Uriah the Hittite, and Jacob sent him to David. And while, while Uriah was with him, David asked him, How? Joab was doing, How are you soldiers? How's the day going? And he's just making small talk, okay? So he starts off with this small talk with Uriah the Hittite. And I'm going to just paraphrase this so we don't have to read all the way through it. But he visits with Uriah, and uh, he says, Well, Uriah, you know, uh, i tell you what. He says, Why don't you just go ahead and go down and spend the night with your wife, and you can, you can go back to the war tomorrow, and, and uh, everything will be good, you know. So he sends Uriah off, and Uriah goes, and he gets word that Uriah didn't get home. Uriah slept on a cot out by the gate with, with the rest of the people out there. So here goes David again. He says, since for Uriah, he says, come on back. I need, you, I need to visit with you. So he comes back. They eat supper, and he tries to get Uriah drunk. So at the end of that afternoon, he says, Uriah, do me a favor. I want you to go back, sleep with your wife. Take some time off before you go back to the field. You can go back to the field tomorrow. You can go back tomorrow, but, but go ahead and go home and do your thing. He's trying to cover up this pregnancy thing going on. He's trying to cover this up, but Uriah says no. He goes down. He sleeps at the gate again. David finds out about it, so here's where David goes with it. He sends a note with Uriah. Can you imagine Uriah has no idea what he's got in his hand, but basically what he's carrying to Joab, is that right? Yes. Joab, that's right. So he, so he sends a message back to Joab and said, put Uriah on the front lines. I want him killed. Now that one sin that started off, just sin. Now I, I, I tell you a lot of times, when you tell one lie, it takes about eight or nine of them to cover them up. It really does. You, you start telling one lie, it leads to another, it leads to another, it leads to another. And that's what's happening here is David's in real trouble here. Number one, if he wasn't the king there, most of the time, if you committed adultery back in the day and time, you got stoned to death. But David's here trying to cover up his sins, so he sends Uriah back with a death sentence in his head, says, give it to Joab. And Joab gets the letter and opens it up and reads it, and he puts Uriah on the front line, and sure enough, Uriah gets killed, along with a lot of other soldiers. So he sends, he sends back Joab back to David and to say, and he told David, says, tell David that Uriah, the hit, that we had, we, lost, we had a lot of casualties in this war, and I want you to go back and tell David that we had some casualties. Now, David's going to get a little upset with you when you tell him. You can go read this whole chapter, but this is kind of, I'm going to just paraphrase it in buster language. But he tells him, he says, you go back and you tell him we lost some soldiers, but before he gets really mad and starts getting upset and chunking stuff, tell him that Uriah the Hittite is dead. So he goes back and he tells David, and David, David didn't get upset at all. Once he, he said, you know, they lost soldiers. Uriah the Hittite's dead. Go back. Now, as this story progresses, he goes to Bathsheba. And he, Bathsheba finds out that Uriah got killed. He goes and consoles her. And then he finds out that he, he, he invites her in to be his, one of his wives. Now, from what I can read from the Bible, he had several wives. I don't, know, I don't know how many wives he actually had. It doesn't say how many wives David had at that time. But it goes on as, as she comes to be one of his wives, the son that she has dies. And this is after the child had been, been raised up a little while and the child gets sick and dies. Now, Dan, David, upset about this, and he, he kept praying to God, please don't take him, please don't take him, you know. He, he fasted, he, he tore his clothes, he'd done all the things he was supposed to do to try to change God's mind, please don't take my son. But he did. Now here, but if you go ahead and read the next chapter, you'll find out that, that there's a messenger that comes to David that tells him a story about a guy and a sheep 
and how the the servant the the king took a, one man's sheep and butchers it to feed the, feed some people. So as that story progresses, he finds out that the guy is sending a message to David saying. David, you're the guy that took somebody else's stuff that didn't belong to you. Now, here's a lot of things that, that David committed. With just the one act of seeing her, inviting her up to his room, it starts off, one of them is, thou shall not commit adultery. That's one. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. That's two, because he sent Uriah back to be killed. Thou shall not murder. And he sent Uriah back to be killed. So he broke down on several, several of the commandments there. Knowing, knowing that God, God had blessed David up to this point. He had several wives. And God sent a message through, a, through one of the prophets and said, David, if you needed more wives, I don't have, I'm going to tell you something. I've got plenty with just one. I don't know about you guys. I'm good with one. I like my one. I'm good with that. But David had several of them. And he, and he adds to his, and, and God says, if you need more wives, all you have to do is ask. I'd send you some more wives. You know, the, the, all you have to do is ask. You didn't have to go through all this. But then he takes all of his wives, and he says, David, since you could, this is God telling David, since you've done this, your wives are going to become adulterous too. In broad daylight, you're going to be able to see your wives having affairs with other men in broad daylight. Now, I'm getting all of this from Samuel 11 through 12. So do me a favor, when you get home, don't think that, don't take my word for it, read it. It's there for you to read. That's kind of what is going on here. There's a lot of des deceits that went on through this whole process from one mistake. So from one mistake, it led to an anthill of all kinds of stuff. Now, I'm going to switch this over to another verse, if you don't mind. We're going to visit one more life. Let's go to, uh, let's go to, uh, uh, oh, let's go to Genesis 39, I think is where it's at. Let me, let me try to pull my memory back. I think it's 39. Yes, 39. All right, we're going to go to Joseph's life. Now, we're going to, we're switching gears. We're going to another life here. Genesis chapter 39, we're going to start off in 1. Up to this point, Joseph, was one of the, he was one of, the, one of his father's favorite kids. He had several sons. The other brothers to Joseph didn't like him. They didn't like the special treatment that he got. They was out in the field. So anyway, long story short, they sent for Joseph. They talked about killing Joseph, but they ended up putting him in a cistern. And then they sold him as a slave. Now, God is with Joseph all the time. I hear people say, I don't understand why good things happen. I'm sorry. I don't understand why bad things happen to good people. And I don't understand why good things happen to bad people. But the Bible says, in Matthew 5, 45, it says, The sun rises on the evil and the just. It rains on the righteous and the unrighteousness. So good things happen to all people. Bad things happen to all people. So it's not just that. But anyway, let's pick it up where Joseph's been taken. Now, and it's I'll start in, verse, let's just go ahead and pick it up from verse 1, 39-1. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, and the captain of the guard brought him to the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. He lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes. He became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of the household. He entrusted him with all the care of everything he owned. From that time, he put him in charge of his, of his household and all that he owned. The Lord blessed the household and the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had and both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except what he had to eat. And now Joseph 
was a handsome looking dude, well built, kind of like me, you know. And anyway, I heard that. <laughs> now Joseph was well built and, and handsome, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, "Come and go to bed with me." Okay. Here's here's where I want to get us to to this point. Understand this: sin is going to you're going to be tempted by sin every day. You can be used as an instigator like the snake for no reason. You can cause people to sin. It's not going to benefit you at all. It's just, it's just funny to you. But what, what I want you to do is be aware of the different types of sin that when we think it's funny, it's not funny to God. And when you start met, and I'm going to tell you, when, when you start messing with other people's lives by being an instigator, God is going to frown on you big time. He does not like you to make his children fall. He says in the Bible several places about making his children fall. Don't make them fall. So we ought to lift them up and not be instigated. But anyway, Joseph refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife then I could do such a wicked thing and sin against God. Joseph, and I love what he did. Joseph goes to her and says, or he doesn't go to her, she's trying to get him to, to go to bed with her. She goes and he says to her, this will not work for my master and God. God will frown on this. What I'm trying to get you to realize, if we as Christians, can learn how to say, my God, my God, the Lord that I serve is not going to be happy with what you're tempting me with. He will not be happy. So therefore, I refuse to smoke marijuana with you. I don't know what it is. I don't know, I don't know what, what, whatever God, however you get tempted in this life, and whether it's women, marijuana, internet, whatever. If you will put God out there, I, I found the hardest thing, the hardest thing to do when you're trying to witness to somebody is to say God. But the minute, I'm going to promise you this, you listen to these, you mark this down, but the minute you say God, my God, your mouth will start going, and it's in, it's in the overdrive mode, and God will handle your speech from there. But you've got to get God out of your mouth first. And until you get God out, you're fighting with devil. Just like the snake. God created the serpent. He made the serpent. He, but he said he was a smart aleck. I mean, he was, just a, he was just a smart aleck. Now, Satan entered into the serpent and used the serpent to cause problems. So what I'm saying to you is don't allow Satan to use you to cause problem in somebody else's life. Don't let him do it. Remember the word, God, my God. The first time you get tempted, my God would not like me listening to this joke and walk away. Y'all struggle with that? Anybody have a problem with walking away from somebody telling a dirty joke? A lot of times I'll say, is this a good one or a bad one? If it's nasty, I don't need to be here. It's real simple for me. I don't need to hear it. Don't want to hear it. Let's go on. One day, I'm picking up on 11. One day he went to the house to attend his duties. None of the household servants was there. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me again. Now this, this is, you can brush up against sin and it will finally grab you. Sin will get you. You've got to... The Bible says steer totally away from it. Joseph was doing his best to stay away from, from the wife. So she grabbed him by the cloak. He, he runs, he, and he leaves his cloak there. Now, she takes his cloak, and she starts this commandment. Thou shalt not give false testimony against your neighbor. She, so she picks up, and she says, to her husband, to the officials, this guy, Joseph, 
wanted to have sex with me. I tore his jacket off of him, and, and I screamed, and he went running. And that's where you guys come in, and thank you for coming in to rescue me. Now, she gives false testimony. Now, Joseph ends up, if you read the rest of the story, Joseph ends up going to prison. But what I find unusual about Joseph is Joseph is a happy prisoner. The warden of the unit, I'm going to use warden, I don't know how they did it back in the day. The warden of the unit recognized Joseph, and Joseph got the task of really just being a happy prisoner, and he put him in charge of a lot of things because he realized that God was with him. For two years he stayed in prison. Why do good things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know, but Joseph hung to the word, buddy. He hung tough. Then he gets put back in charge because Pharaoh has an, a dream that he needs to interpret it, and they say, we know a guy that can do it. So they go get Joseph, bring him back. Joseph interprets the dream, and sure enough, it happened just like he said. And then Joseph is brought back to power in Pharaoh's house in charge of everything that Pharaoh did. So if God is with you, the Bible says, if God is with you, who can be against me? But you've got to get God out of your mouth. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't rub up against sin. You really can't. You just It's going to get you. Mark my words, if you keep rubbing up against sin, it will get you. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to mess with you long enough till he gets you. Then, once he gets you, it's all downhill from there until you come to the realization, God, I really messed up. I've made a mess of my life. I listened to Satan. I've lost my family over this. I've lost my health over this. I lost my sons and my daughters over this. God, I need you to pick me back up, dust me off, clean me up, and I'm going to get rid of this sin, and I'm sorry for straying away from your word. Sorry for listening to you. Sorry for listening to the devil. Sorry. So there's three ways. There's a lot of ways to sin in this world. One of them is to be an instigator with nothing to, nothing to win other than just to, just to treat somebody sad, sadly, to get them to stray away from God's way. Another one is to be a receiver of that and go ahead and sin, rubbing up against it, and you finally just come, say, okay, I'll give in. And another one is to be a follower. And let's just go, let's go, I, I'm, I'm thankful back in my day we didn't have drugs in our school. We, we had them. We really did. I just never did have to fight the battle like they do now. But just because... My friend Johnny smokes marijuana. Doesn't make it all right for me to smoke marijuana. And Johnny's going to try to get me to do this. Johnny ain't got nothing to win by me smoking marijuana other than just to introduce me to something else. All you got to do is say this. My God that I serve, that lives in my life, would not be appreciative of me smoking marijuana. He wouldn't be. And whatever that sin is, it, you, it can be anything. I mean, it could be just, there's a multitude of sins out there. My God would not be happy if I'm on the Internet doing what I'm doing. My God would not be happy with me flirting with another man's wife. When you start messing around with another man's wife, you destroy families. You don't just destroy your life. You destroy families. You destroy her life, his life, your life, your family. You destroy a lot of things. So what I'm going to encourage us as a church to do is to do this, is to understand that God lives inside this body right here. If you're a born-again Christian today, and you've invited Jesus into your heart. He lives inside of you. He'll, he'll keep you on the straight and the narrow. Now you can get off in the ditch. And you can leave God and say, God, today when I go to school, you can't go with me. I'm going to lock you in the closet. You stay here. And when I get home, I'll pick you back up. But today you're not going with me. That's not the way God works. 
That's not the way he works. He wants to be with you 24-7. Let me tell you something. You know who else wants to be with you 24-7? Satan. That deceiver wants to be with you 24-7. So you can put your mind on the things God would like you to do. You can put your mind on the things that Satan would like you to do. Satan is going to try to convince you that it's good, like the apple is. He's going to try to convince you. What You know, it's going to be so great when you do this. It's going to be so good. You, you just And what you're going to find out is it's going to destroy you. So here's where we're going to go with this today. I'm going to encourage each one of us as a family is to put God in charge of our life and to say, God, 24-7, Live here. Live in my heart. Help me to learn how to say God, my God. Help me learn to say that. That's a hard word to say. I'm going to tell you something. You try it. I guarantee you try it. If you go somewhere and you're being tempted and all you got to do is say, my God is not going to like this. Your whole world is going to change right then. Everything's going to turn around for you real quick. And you just let God say whatever God needs to say through you. I don't want to be a part of this. Whatever he tells you to do, you follow through. But you've got to get my God out of your mouth. It's a hard thing to say. But get it out there. And the second thing, you've got to have God living in your heart. So I don't know if you've ever invited Jesus into your, into your life. I don't know. I don't know that. If you've never done that, you need to do that. For Mother's Day, for Father's Day, for Daughter's Day, for Son's Day, for Uncle's Day, for Brother's Day, whatever relationship you are, the best gift you can give anybody. I can send my wife to uh, Rome and let her enjoy all the beauty, but the best gift I could give her is let her know that my God lives here. I've gave my life to him. And no matter what happens to Buster, if for some reason we have a wreck going home, you live and I go to heaven, I'll be in heaven waiting on you. The best gift you can give. Children, kids, teenagers, whatever you are, the best gift you can give to your mom and dad is mom, dad. I gave my life to Jesus. He lives right here. I know you worry about me when I go out at night, and I know you worry about me when I drive my car. And I know you worry about me in, in, when I'm in school. But the best gift you can give to your mom and your dad, to your friends, to your brothers, is Jesus lives right here. No matter what happens to me today, I'm going to be in heaven if something goes wrong. I'll be there when you get there. You got to, You got to have Jesus live in your heart. You can't get there unless you got Him. Okay. I want you to understand that you cannot. You cannot go around the corner and try to get by Jesus and try to get to heaven without going through Jesus. You can't get there. God says the only way you can come to Christ is through Jesus. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for your sins. You got to invite Him in. If you've never done that, if you've never done that, I'm going to ask you to just take your hats off right now. Even if you have done that, take your hats off. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, and you want to do that today, and God's speaking to you, if He's tugging at your heart, you know you've messed up with your life, and you know what you're doing is not right, and you're ready for that change. You're ready for that, get rid of all the old stuff. And start anew. Say this prayer with me, please. My God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. But God, I want to just invite you into my life. I know I'm not going to be perfect when I invite you into my life. But I know that I need to make a change. And I'm going to invite you in. I know, God, that you died on the cross for my sins. I know that you're alive today. Father God, I invite you into my life. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Lead me and guide me in everything that I do. 
Father God, I'm going to put this all at your throne. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for your word. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Father God, I love you. I want you in my life from this day forward. I give it all to you in your precious name. Amen.